Well, ha happy Sabbath and welcome to you all and to what guests that we have. Uh, I want to start this out with uh, one announcement that I do have to make here. And we normally don't have a fellowship meal on the last Sabbath, but we're having one today. And uh, some of the ladies have, have prepared a, a meal for us. And I need to see a show of hands of how many of you plan on staying for the Sabbath meal. If you raise your hands and keep them up there so they can see your hands and uh, take count so they know what they're dealing with. So you got it there? OK. That'll, that'll take care of that. Now, are there any, anybody else have any announcements to make? No? Now, if you would turn your Bibles to James, the book of James, and I'm going to read James, uh, first James, uh, two through four. James two through four. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect working, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. So, anyway, those who are able, uh, we will kneel now for prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we come to before you giving thanks for the works and the gift of our salvation and for what, for what Jesus had done for us and that it's not only our sins that was covered, he even took our guilt and our shame. And in all things, Father, uh, there isn't a one of us that don't have a testimony of your mighty hand and the work that's been done in our lives, the changes that's been made in us. Oh, and Father, that we may, each and every one of us, go forth boldly and proclaim that what you've done for us that others may see and have faith and come to you as well. There are many there out there that have great needs and have no idea where to turn. So, secondly, Father, this is the top of my list. You've heard the very different prayer requests that were given. Uh, it's hard for me to hear those up here, so it's hard for me to repeat those, but you heard them. And there are many prayer requests unspoken. I have some myself. And, but the main thing for me that I pray and ask for is for our young people, Lord. I believe that there is to be an army of our young people that will be out there in the forefront to finish the work that is to be done here. And they, of all the things that, not just me, but all the older people here, what we were faced with and the, the trials and so on that we went through, and we knowing our, our carnal, 
our carnality, Father, <clears throat> and what a walk this has been for us. And I see with what the enemy has done uh, and how the internet and everything else has been used and how much greater the enemy has come against our children, our young ones. And Father, I ask that they be strengthened and they might hear and know and not turn away. That you keep them, Father. My prayers go up for them. They go up for our families. And I know the promises that you've made concerning our children. And I believe your word is true. And I give you thanks now, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now time for our tithes and offerings. Today's offering for the Oregon Conference Youth Support. I want to read from Mark 10, verses 14 to 15. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. The disciples had rebuked people that were bringing their children in to, to Jesus. But we need to bring our children in to Jesus. We need to help all over the conference, all over the world. The children, because they are the future of this church. We need to raise them correctly. We need to give them spiritual guidance. And it takes our money sometimes to do this. So that's why the offering for the youth support. So let's keep that in mind and also keep our church in mind. The youth here and all the work that we're doing right now does cost money. I know, everybody doesn't like to have harped on all the time, but I am bringing up appeals for the money that this church needs, the Lord needs it. It's his, we're just returning a portion to him. Let's please stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you for this day, and we thank you for the rain we're getting. Thank you for all your many blessings. We pray that you'll bless this offering and use it to the furtherment of the, your good here on earth. Be with us as we go through this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Peter, we're going to read 1 Peter 2, 9. 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Brother John. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to you, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's been a while since I've been here, but uh, I always enjoy coming back, so it's nice to be here. Um, before we go begin, let me just say a, a little prayer that the Lord would watch over me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to talk more about some of the things that you would have us do in these last days. Guide and direct us now, and May the truth be spoken and may it touch our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk about Adventists as peculiar people. 
and that's a good thing. Um, we have this uh, uh, admonition from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is God speaking to the to the SDA Church. God has declared, "I am instructed to say to Seventh Day Adventists the world over, God has called us as a people to be peculiar treasure unto Himself." So that's our calling. We're to be a peculiar people to the rest of the world. Peculiar, different from the normal. And now you could be peculiar and you could be odd and kind of strange, but you could also be quite, um, quite peculiar but in a good way, you know, where people can look at you and, and re with respect. And that's the kind of peculiar we're talking about. Um, let me give you a little background on how I feel about this and why I brought up this subject. When I first came to Oregon, I grew up in New Jersey, and I had never, I, and this is true, I'd never heard of the Seventh-day Adventists. I didn't know who they were uh, until I came out west. Um, when I was young, my sister and I were sent to uh, a Protestant church, Presbyterian church, and um, then I got out in the world and did many different things, and finally I ended up in Williams, Oregon. And when I first came to Williams, Oregon, Every Saturday, a man would knock on, I was living in a trailer because I was building a home, and um, a man would knock on my trailer door every afternoon on Saturday, and I would look out and with these very old man, you know, he must have been in his 90s, but he always, he had a, a jacket and he had a tie on, and he would knock on my door and I'd say yes, and he'd say, would, I, would you like me to pray with you? And I felt a little, you know, uncomfortable because I was not familiar with that. And I think the first time I said no. And then the next time he came, I said yes. But I re always remembered him. I didn't know who he was, but it was kind of different that he would come and do that. And then a couple weeks later, I was uh, in my, I finally moved into the house and I was watching television. And I look up and I see two little children looking in the window of my house and I said, what's going on? So I went outside and I said, what are you doing? They were the children that lived up front. And they said, well, we had never seen a TV before. Our, our mom and my mom and dad doesn't want us to watch TV. So we just wanted to know what it was all about. And I thought, wow, that's, that's strange. It's, that's peculiar. And then I come to find out the people living in front of me were Adventists, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. That's the first inkling I had of what an Adventist was. And then a couple, uh, maybe a month or two later, I was doing some carpentry work for a family, Ed and Amy Denke, and they happened to be Adventists, and I got to talking to him as well. And then after that, my mom, who came out to live with me, my dad had died, she came home one day, she was at the Safeway on Williams Highway, and she said, you know, a man was going out giving these books, and I know you, you like this kind of book, so I, I took it and I brought it home, and it was um, America and Prophecy. It was a short version of the Great Controversy. I don't know who this Adventist was, but he was handing out this book, and it really was a blessing to me because when I got the book, I started to read it, and I thought, "Wow, this is you know, this is biblical. This is interesting," and it also mentioned the Sabbath, you know, and I started to think about that, and I and then all then I start working with Amy and Ed Denke, and I start telling him about this, and he had um, the the. Uh, the Conflict of the Ages series, you know, like six or seven of these red books and the Desire of Ages, the Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets. He said, take them home, read them. He said, you might be interested. So I took them home and I was reading them. And I'm thinking, wow, all this Adventist stuff coming at me all of a sudden here, you know, and they were kind of different. People are kind of different. And then I, I moved to town. I finally moved to town. Uh, my, it was kind of rough for my mom out in the country. So I moved to town. And who do you think I moved next door to? Seventh-day Adventist, Ed Sexton. And I said, wow, another, <laughs> another Adventist. And then I started, to get, um, I started to get high blood pressure like my family had, and I had some nosebleeds and went to the doctor. Actually, I went to an optometrist because I was getting floaters in my eyes. And he said, you need a change in your diet and just get a good, on a good diet. So I came home. And I didn't know what to do. There was a thousand diets out there. So I went over to my good friend, Ed, Adventist Ed, and I told him, I said, you know, I, I have changed my lifestyle. I need a new diet. And he said, he didn't say a word. He just reached behind him on a shelf and he pulls out a book 
He says, here, read this. And it was Council on Diet and Foods by A.G. White. And I took it home, and I was like a sponge. I, I just read the whole thing within a couple of days. And I, I was completely convicted because the Lord had set me up, you know, with all these Adventists and reading these books, so I was ready. And then getting sick, and I never really, you know, I wasn't afraid to give up diet because you know, my health was more, much more important, at least in my eyes. Anyway, I changed my diet completely, and within a couple of days, I just went, you know, cold turkey. I didn't wait it. I didn't gradually go into it. I just went into it. And within six months, I lost 50 pounds, and uh, my blood pressure went down. I never had another nosebleed. I never had to go to the doctor for medication. And I thought, wow, this is really something. These Adventists have everything. They have not only scripture, they stay with the Bible, and they also have a health message. So I started taking Bible lessons from um, an older couple in our church, Merle and Mildred Tillotson, I don't know if you remember them, an older family. And I took Bible studies with them, and then 1995, I was baptized in the Rogue River. Cold April day. But, so, you know, I, I was looking back, and it was peculiar how it all occurred, and some of the people I met were quite peculiar, but in a nice way. They were different. They were different. The man who knocked on my door, and, you know, the children who'd never watched TV before, and then the health message, and all these things. So, um, I thought I want to talk a little bit more about what it means to be an Adventist and why we should stay peculiar. And these are some verses uh, from Scripture about that. Um, the Lord's saying, For thou art, a, well, Moses saying this, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself. And that's what we're to be, a peculiar people in the Lord's eyes for, for all of us. And um, and to purify himself of peculiar people, zealous of good works. So we want to be zealous of good works that others will see it. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. So we're a peculiar people, and even our name is peculiar, right? When I first heard the name, I'm thinking Seventh-day Adventist, you know? It's an unusual name. But no name which we can take will be appropriate, but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us as a peculiar people. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. Here is the line of distinction between the worshipers of God and those who worship the beast. Right? Seventh-day Adventist. We keep the seventh day and we're looking for the soon advent of our Lord's return. It's right in our name. So we shouldn't, um, you know, I, I hear some talk, sometimes people say, well, maybe we shouldn't put Adventists, you know, on the name of the church outside. Maybe that'll dissuade people from coming. No, no, no. The Lord has designed that name to be just what it is. It'll attract the right people. Another thing that um, makes us peculiar is how we keep the Sabbath. You know, when I was younger, um, Sunday keepers didn't really keep the Sabbath, uh, didn't really keep Sunday. I remember in, our, in my town, we had a, um, a Catholic high school, a Queen, Queen of Peace High School, and they would play their football games on Sunday. And it was nothing about keeping the Sabbath. So even the Christian world, although they kept Sunday, they didn't really keep the Sabbath. But here's how you keep the Sabbath. You call the Sabbath a delight the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. That's, that's difficult, but it sh should be easy once you come to love the Lord and you want to keep his commandments. Um, what does it mean, speaking thine own words? Don't speak thine own words. The spirit of prophecy has a, a real nice defi definition in youth instructor. When you are speaking of your hope in God, of Jesus and of his soon coming, and of the beauties of the new earth, you are not speaking your own words. Those are the kind of words that we should be speaking of on the Sabbath. And sometimes it's difficult, even as Adventists. You know, you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden, you know, your car troubles come up or you bought this or you bought that. Or, and that's not Sabbath talk. So some. You have to be real careful sometimes, even amongst our friends, that you don't want to get caught up in worldly things on the Sabbath. I also found out very quickly, and I admired it, that we're people of the book. 
we put the Bible first. You know, we don't put people or our friends or our opinions or articles we read. No, the Bible. Everything is tested by the Bible. Isaiah eight twenty. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, is because there's no light in them. So we have to check everything with scripture. Like the Bereans, we have to be honorable. We always check, even what Paul said, they would check with scripture to make sure he was saying was true. And I remember one time I went to this, um, I was getting my TV or something fixed, and I went to this store, and there was a couple people in there, and I kind of knew, and they were kind of religious, and they were talking about religious matters, and they were saying things that really weren't scripture. And I just mentioned, I said, you know, we have to remember Isaiah eight twenty. You know, we have to check everything with, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to these things, there's no light in them. And one of the men said, can't you just talk from your heart? You have to give me scripture. And then I realized, you know, a lot of people don't want scripture. They just want my opinion. It's more comfortable. So we don't want to be like that. God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as a standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord. All right? And we should always adhere to that. We don't accept anything if it doesn't jive with Scripture. New Age thinking. You've heard it. You know, that's going around now and... Um, uh, it's all summed up very well. It was a nice book that I read a while back, um, New Age Bible Versions by um, Gail Ripplinger. And in it, she, she sums the whole matter up. This is what basically is driving uh, New Age thinking, that there is no authority superior to the guidance of a person's inner self. In other words, we all have a little bit of God in us, and we should act according to what we think is right in our heart. And, um, you know, uh, I remember I had a friend, an older friend, and he was into the Bible and all that, but he didn't keep the Sabbath, and he didn't do a lot of things according to Scripture. And one day I was talking to him, and I said, you know, I said, we should keep the commandments of God, right? He said, oh, yeah. He said, that's right. I said, well, I said, that's why I keep the Sabbath. I said, uh, we should be keeping Saturday. He says, you know, John, I thought about that, but my heart tells me that's not that important. Um, any old, any day is all right, as long as you love the Lord. And I said, yeah, but the scripture says that it should be on the Sabbath. And I say, are you telling me that you, your feelings trump scripture? He said, right, that's right. He said, the Holy Spirit in me is what I go by. I don't go by the scripture. So there was an example of that kind of thinking. It's not good because... Um, you know, as the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things. So we don't want to go, go listening to our heart. We we'll always check what our heart is telling us, what Scripture says. And this is very satanic when you think about it, because what did Satan say in the very beginning? He, Satan, reiterated his claim that angel. he was talking about, the, you know, the conflict in heaven. Angels needed no control, but should be left to follow their own will, which would ever guide them right. See, it's that same kind of thinking. You know, my inner self I go by. It'll always guide me right. That was Satan was trying to say that, and God was too restricted with all his commandments and, and things like that. And uh, God was arbitrary, capricious, you know, just holding us back. Now, you remember all of Satan's claims. Same just like the New Age thinking. And, of course, he's behind New Age thinking. Now you go to the Catholic Church. You know, during the Reformation, Martin Luther and others were bringing us back to the Bible. And they were showing that Scripture was being contradicted by the, the rules and the traditions of the Catholic Church. And that shouldn't be right. We should be going by the Bible only. And the Catholic Church didn't know how to combat that because they, there were some basic truths they were bringing out. So they had a Council of Trent in 1545. And it took quite a while, many, many different meetings, and they come up with this. At the Council of Trent in 1545, the Catholic Church said that the church traditions, both written and unwritten, are received and venerated with equal affection to the Old and New Testaments. So here again is Satan interposing his beliefs that tradition is just as important as scripture. And that's how they could justify some of the things they did, even though they weren't scriptural. 
Even the, even the, 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 the Jewish people today have that same problem. They have the Tanakh, which is the, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, just like ours. But they also have the Talmud. And the Talmud is the writing of all the rabbis through the centuries. And, and talking to or listening on YouTube to many of these um, Jewish people who became Christians, they have said that when they went to the synagogue, all they heard was talk from the Talmud, never from the Bible. It was always what the rabbis had said, and the rabbis had said this, and the rabbis had said that. They didn't even know their scriptures. So it's the same problem again, and that's why it's so important that we, the Bible and the Bible only. Another thing I noticed, uh, dress and manners. You know, um, we're told that we should be dressing neatly and, and be uh, mannerly in our deportment. And I often thought about that and, uh, you know, how, it, uh, how it's important to dress clean and be clean and neat no matter what you're doing. It's, uh, you're re reflecting a godly uh, manner. And uh, I remember one day I was thinking about that and I was outside in front of a store waiting for my wife. I don't know if it was my wife or my mother at the time. I can't remember. But I was waiting outside the store. I think it was Albertsons, the old Albertsons downtown. And uh, I was watching people come in and going out, and I'm thinking, you know, these people are really sloppy. Everybody's so sloppy, you know. They're uh, wearing, you know, real sloppy clothes and flip-flop shoes and their hair. And, and I'm thinking, that's yeah, terrible. And then I look over in the distance, and I see a couple coming, and I thought, wow, here's a couple nicely, neatly dressed. And I, as they got closer, it happened to be two members of my church in Grants Pass. Didn't even realize. But the whole point was that they stuck out. They were peculiar. They were dressed neat. They weren't dressed fancily or, you know, they didn't have a suit and tie on, but they were neat. And that's important. Our faith is carried out, will lead us to be so plain in dress and zealous of good works that we shall be marked as peculiar. When believers are neglectful of their dress and are coarse and rough in their manners, their influence hurts the truth. Remember that we must all answer to God for the influence we exert. And that's really important, you know. We want to have a good influence. Now, who wants to be a Christian if you Christians are, you know, just like the rest of the world? We don't want that. No. Self-denial in dress is a part of our Christian duty. To dress plainly and abstain from display of jewelry and ornaments of every kind is in keeping with our faith. And that makes us peculiar. You know, you'll see a woman... An Adventist woman, you dress nice and neatly, but no makeup, you know, and no jewelry. There's something different about that, but something nice, too, you know. Um, our faith will lead us to be so plain in dress and zealous of good works that we shall be marked as peculiar. And we are, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. Our first love should always be Jesus, too. Amen. And... Um, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And, um, you know, um, you remember the story of Eli. He, he loved his sons. He did, was afraid to rebuke them. He didn't rebuke them like he should. And when he did rebuke them, it was always mild. And the Lord, uh, the Lord was very displeased with Eli for that. And you honor your sons above me. And of course, you know, you know the rest of the story. Eli's family was just, his sons were killed in battle and uh, never did have a man to sit as a priest after, uh, from Eli's progeny. And that's because he loved uh, his sons more than he loved God. And I remember one time I was, um, I was listening to a radio program, kind of a spiritual program, and this, this lady called in to the man and she said, you know, I'm looking for a husband. I want to I wanna get married, but I'm afraid. I, I, what should I look for in a man? And this guy said to her, he says, well, he says, what you have to do is you have to pick a man who loves God more than he loves you. And um, she stopped and thought about that, you know, because you, usually you want somebody to love you more than anything else in the whole world, but that's not good. If your wife or your husband loves you, more than he loves God, there's going to be trouble. So that's always a nice thing to remember. You put God first, and when you put God first, you'll always love others. You can't help but love others if you put God first and you love the truth first. So that's what we want to be. We want to be honest and true and, and love what's right first and let people see that about us. That's being peculiar. 
Temperance was another thing that, that I admired, actually, in the Adventist church. One of the reasons I joined was their health message and temperance. Those who serve God in sincerity and truth will be a peculiar people, unlike the world, separate from the world. Their food will be prepared not to encourage gluttony or gratify a perverted taste, but to secure to themselves the greatest physical strength and the best mental condition. So, you know, you want to eat because it's good for your body, not just because it tastes good. If you, and you have to be abstinence. You know, you have to practice abstinence. And what is abstinence? You, you know, refusal of all things harmful and judicious use of those things that are good. Even the good you don't want to overdo, but you want to completely eliminate the bad. And you'll hear people say sometimes, well, a little alcohol, maybe, a, uh, you know, drinking a little bit here and there is okay. No, it's not. No. Anything that's injurious, you don't want to do. It requires moral courage to resist temptation on the point of appetite. Such practice will be a surprise to those who do not practice habits of total abstinence from all stimulants. Here is the very opportunity to manifest that we are peculiar people, zealous of good works. You know, when people see the way we eat, they're going to inquire, what are you doing? How, why? Then you can explain more, you know. Um, eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness, Solomon said that, and that's so true, you know. And, um, I remember um, when I was back, uh, back east, I, I go back once in a while to visit my sister who lives back east in New Jersey, and um, they know I practice the health message, and, they, and you know, they're, they're, good, they're okay with that, and they know I'm a vegetarian, so they, when my sister cooks, she cooks accordingly for me, not for them, but for me and my wife. But anyway, I was there one day, and um, my nephew, my sister's son's wife, was having a problem with mucus, you know, always having to clear her throat and blow her nose, a lot of mucus. So I mentioned, I just mentioned to her, I said, you know, I said, you know, it might be a good idea to eliminate that and try this. For 30 days, give up all dairy, because dairy is one of the leading causes of mucus formation. And she looked at me and she said, ooh, I've never given up anything. I've, I've never had to give up anything. In other words, it was like a shock to her that she would actually have to give up something she liked to get a change. And I thought about that later, and I thought, wow, you know, there's a lot of people in the world who are, are just really kind of shocked when they have to give up something. But that's part of being a Christian. We have to give up things that aren't good for us, right? Because our first duty is to God. And he gave us these wonderful bodies. We've got to take care of them. So abstinence is important, and when and that's a it's a wonderful entering wedge. You know, I used to go on mission trips um, a while back, and I'd go to South America, and I'd um, I'd be with um, uh, this woman, Catalina Moore. Her name was. She would invite uh, me down with another Adventist man, and and she would be our translator. And she was really a good cook, and she knew how to prepare Adventist foods and all. And whenever we'd start a campaign, it would never be about the Revelation and Daniel first. It would always be health seminar. And the people would just flock to these health seminars. We'd, many, many, many people would come because health was very important to them. And then when we could speak to them about health and some of the things they can do to improve their lives, then, they would, then we'd introduce them to the gospel. And then they'd start to hear more about Jesus and the Adventist message. But what would bring them in was the health message. So my point is, if we know the health message and we practice it, we can be lights to others because many people have afflictions, some minor, some major. And a lot of times medicine's not the answer. Well, mo all the time medicine's not the final answer. It only treats symptoms. We can get to the cause by getting back to the basics. So we can help people that way. And, um, but we've got to be honest and true about it and live it. You know, people want to see us living that. And I'll give you a very good example of that. This Catalina, the woman I'm speaking of, who was our translator, she gave, told me the story one time. She was given a talk in Brazil, and she was given a talk on health, and she went through the whole health message, and the people were impressed. And a, a few of the ladies in the audience happened to be you know, upper class, and they were kind of wealthy, and they said to her, would you come to our house after this meeting and have lunch with us? We'd like to hear more about your health message. So she said, okay. And they went, and they had a great meal. And they talked, and they... So after the meal, they went into the dining area, not into the, in the sitting area room, and they were starting to talk. 
And about an hour after they had eaten and then we're talking for a while, the, the leader of the group got up and went into the kitchen and she made some juice. I think it was orange juice. It could have been pineapple, I don't know. It was some juice and she came out and she offered everybody a juice. And when she came to Catalina, Catalina said, no, uh, we just ate it an hour ago and I, I don't wanna put anything in my stomach right now because I just ate. And the woman said, oh good. We were just testing you. We wanted to see what you would do if we gave you this juice now because we knew it would violate what you had said earlier. So you see how people are always looking, they're, they're testing all the time. You have to be so careful. But of course she was true to the message and they saw that and she was a great testimony right there to um, you know, li pre living what you're preaching. So we have to be that way too. And I remember I was with the health message quite a bit in Grants Pass and we used to teach a New Start cooking school. So a lot of people would pass through our classes. So after a while I would you know, be, go, be here or there and somebody would say, oh, I know you, you were at the you know, New Start class. And I'd say, yeah. So one day um, I went to, I was going to farmer's market and I was buying something. And I, I don't know, the conversation, some lady was there with me and I didn't, I'd never seen her before. We were talking about something and I happened to mention um, Adventist cooking school. And she says, oh, she says, I have an Adventist friend and he eats terribly, or she, I can't remember. Yeah, they don't follow that message. And I, and I thought, well, see, there, there's a case where an Adventist let the Lord down, you know, by not practicing what he was preaching. And people are watching us, you know. So we have to be really careful in that respect. Uh, I bring this up because I think it's timely. There was a, Mrs. White used to have a, a dreams at times, these visions. And, and all these visions, it would be this particular messenger that she would recognize that would come and say things. And this one vision she had during the night she was at a meeting and there were all the elders there and this angel or her guide was talking and he's saying we've got to have a, uh, a temperance pledge. That you pledge that you're going to be temperate in all your ways, abstain from alcohol and smoking and all things injurious. And he went to the first elder and the first elder said, well, I can't, um, I can't do that because there may come a time when I'd have to violate that. You know, sometimes a situation arises where I can't do that. So he refused. And the angel went to the second man and the second man said, no, he said, sometimes I'm under a lot of stress and I need a drink or two once in a while. I can't sign it either. So this angel messenger got, got upset with them. Not upset, you know, he got strong with them and he said, when the plagues of God shall be all around you, you will then see the principles of health reform and strict temperance in all things. That temperance alone is the foundation of all the graces, the foundation of all victories to be gained. Refuse to sign this and you will never have another solicitation. When I read that, it was right in the middle of COVID. And I'm thinking, you know, this is so true. You know, you can look for um, a vaccine and you can look for this and you can look for that, but there'll be more plagues coming, there'll be more sicknesses coming. You can't be relying on man-made um, instrumentalities or medications or stopgap measures. That, that's not gonna be sufficient. And what we really need is a strong immune system. And how do you get that? By following the health message. Temperance alone is the foundation of all the graces. It's really important. And when I thought about that more, and um, temperance means patience. Without temperance, you can't have patience. And without patience, you can't have godliness. So, um, you know, Peter said this, um, to faith, you add virtue. To virtue, you add knowledge. To after you have knowledge, you can have temperance because once you know what to be temperate in, you'll be able to do it. So after knowledge comes temperance, but what comes after temperance? After temperance comes patience. For without patience, you can't have godliness. See how they all come together. That's why it's so important to have temperance. Be able to say no when something, when you know it's about to be. You know, um, there are times I can remember where um, 
well, I failed at that, like a, a second piece of pie or something like that. When you know you're about to do it, you know, I really don't need that. I'm really not that hungry. I'm just looking for, um, you know, sometimes food can be a, an entertainment. You know, you're lonely or you're sad and you want to do something, so you go open the refrigerator door. But when you can say no to that, say no. I already ate. It's not hunger I'm, I'm, I'm looking for here. It's something else. I don't want something else. I only want to eat when I'm hungry. And that kind of thing is a victory. And that gives you patience because you can wait. You can wait. And without patience, you know, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And it's the spirit of prophecies, my life today. It is next to an impossibility for an intemperate person to be patient. See how they all go together. I saw that it was a sacred duty to attend to our health and to arouse others to do their duty. We have a duty to speak, to come out against intemperance of every kind. Point them to God's great medicines, water, pure soft water, for diseases, for health, for cleanliness, and for a luxury. I saw that we should not be silent upon the subject of health. So I, I don't mean you go around looking into people's uh, baskets when you're in the store and seeing what they're buying and things like that. But you, when you have the opportunity, you mention something to them. If you see that they're having a problem, maybe they, their knees are bothering or something, you can mention some things for them. Like I remember one time, there was a man that I saw, he was kind of intemperate and he had gout. And I remember reading that one of the best things for gout is cherries. Cherries and cherry juice are excellent. So I could mention that to him. I said, you know, try ch buy some cherries. It was cherry season too. And when those things can help somebody, they'll come back and they'll start thinking, well, what else does this guy have? And that's how I came into the Adventist church. When I read councils on diet and foods, I thought, what else? Well, this church has got a message. They got a, both a spiritual and a, and a health message. So those are the kind of things. So we should be knowledgeable in the health message and we should be able to train others to do it as well. It's a great entering wedge. Missionary zeal too. Every soul united to Christ will be living missionary to all around him. We must not let the people perish that do not know the binding force of God's law. We are responsible. You know, for the knowledge God has given us, we're responsible to sharing it with others. And I don't mean by beating people over the head with the Bible, but to, to, to be there when a, a nice word can be spoken, you know, that would help somebody. Or just mention the Lord once in a while, or Jesus, in a nice way. And you'll, because people aren't used to hearing talk like that. You know, this is what Jesus was trying to impress on his disciples. And he said to, to um, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said this three times to him. And then he, what did Jesus say? If you love me, feed my sheep, you know? And that's one of our first responsibilities. We love the Lord. We've learned all these things. Let's go help others. Find lost sheep. As Dwayne in his, in his prayer was saying earlier, you know, there's so many people out there that are lost. And we have a message. We have to learn how to share it. And that's a talent we all have. Our influence is a talent. And we all have some kind of influence. Are you seeking to save the souls of your companions? This hit me when I first read this because... I was looking a lot of times just to be friendly with people, and they would like me, and I would like them, and I didn't put their souls first. But listen what this says from evangelism. Are you seeking to save the souls of your companions? Is that the object of your association with them? Is that what we do when we, when we see a friend, we want to be with them? Do we have their soul first in mind? Do you... Do they see and feel that there is in you a living embodiment of the Spirit of Christ? Is it manifest that you are a witness for Christ, that you belong to a peculiar people zealous of good works? Is that what they see when they see us when we go visit our friends? Are we a living testimony? You remember the story of Hezekiah? He was sick unto death. He was going to die. He turned his face face to the wall and pray to the Lord, Lord, you know, uh, how can I praise you in the grave? And Isaiah came in to him and heard that the Lord heard the prayer, sent Isaiah. And but before that, the Lord had told Isaiah to come and tell him to get, put your house in order, you're going to die. And then he prayed. And then as Isaiah was leaving, 
uh, the, the Lord heard the prayer of Isaiah, and I mean the prayer of Hezekiah, and ha Isaiah turned back and said, the Lord has given you 15 more years to live. And he put a poultice of uh, figs on, it, on his sores, and he was healed. It was a great thing, and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the known world at that time knew about this. That was a wonderful thing that happened to Hezekiah. And, even they, and, and as a sign that this was gonna happen, even the, the sundial turned back 10 degrees, you know? It was amazing. So um, the Syrian, or I think it was the Syrians, sent some ambassadors. They wanted to talk to Hezekiah about all this. So when the ambassadors came, um, Hezekiah started talking to them. But he didn't talk about what the Lord had done for him. He just talked about all the wonderful things he had, you know, the gold, the silver, and he showed him everything he had. He didn't talk about what the Lord had done for him. So we read in 2 Kings 20:15. Isaiah asked him, what have they seen in thine house? Asking Hezekiah. And Hezekiah answered, all the things that are in mine house they have seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. And Hezekiah put a curse on that and told him that um, in 50 years they're gonna come back and destroy you and take your children, etc." Uh, because you had, not, you had not blessed the Lord. You had not told them what the Lord had done for you. And this comes from Prophet and Kings. Had Hezekiah improved the opportunity, giving him to bear witness to the power, the goodness, the compassion of the Lord of Israel, the report of the ambassadors would have been like as light piercing darkness. But Hezekiah magnified himself above the Lord of hosts, for his heart was lifted up. So we have to be careful too, you know, when, when we have an opportunity to witness, when the Lord has done something for us, don't hide it, you know? I mean, you know, you have to be uh, judicious in, in, in saying this, but, you know, uh, you give glory to God for, for doing the things that he has done. Let other people know that it was the Lord that did it, not you. And, um, you'll, be, you'll be, you know, it'll be a great mark on people. Honesty, let your speech, that's another thing we wanna be sh really careful of, that we're always honest in all our dealings. People are looking at us very carefully. Let your speech be yea, yea, nay, nay, and whatever is more than these of, of the evil one. These words teach that no one who tries to appear what he is not, or whose words do not convey the real sentiment of his heart can be called truthful. And going back, I remember when I was first telling you about when I first moved to Williams, this man in front and his two children came to look at my TV because they had never seen one before. Well, this man was an Adventist. And um, one day I was out talking to him and he was telling me about his station wagon he had that the transmission was going. And he said to me, you know, John, he says, I'm gonna have to get rid of this car before, get rid of this vehicle before that transmission goes. He said, so I'm gonna put it up for sale. And I said, yeah, I said, but you know, you gotta tell the person that the transmission's going. You don't wanna give somebody a, a vehicle that's gonna break down on them. And he looked at me and he was like, got embarrassed because he realized what I just said was true and he wasn't gonna do that. And he said, yeah, 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 I guess you're right. But see, he went down in my eyes. I wasn't an Adventist yet, but here he is an Adventist and he was gonna do something dishonest, you know? So we have to be so careful. The people are watching us all the time. You're an Adventist, you're a Christian, are you acting like one? I don't know, do you lose your temper? Do you put other people first? You know, things like that, they're watching us. Don't try to appear what you're not. And, and you can even by a glance sometimes give the wrong impression. You don't have to say a word, but you, you're deceiving. So we have to be real careful, people are watching. Another thing we have to be careful of as Adventists and as Christians is not to go around doomy and gloomy, you know, and, you know, how are you feeling today, John? And I'm not going to say, oh, I got this problem, I got that problem, and things are mounting up, the trouble, I have trouble here, I have trouble. You don't want to do that. I mean, who wants to be a Christian if you're going to act like that? You know, you don't let, you don't tell the world that. If we do represent Christ, we shall make his service appear attractive as it really is. Christians who gather up gloom and sadness to their souls and murmur and complain are given to others a false representation of God and the Christian life. They, should give the, they give the impression that God is not pleased to have his children happy. 
And in this they bear false witness against our Heavenly Father. Okay, we could be going through a temptation or a crisis, but there's always light on the other side. And we have Jesus on our side, and there's no temptation that's too great for us to bear. So we should, you know, don't be so gloomy. But we also don't want to be, you know, uh, uh, full of levity and joking. That's not a Christian either. We have to have a balance. We have to have true Christian dignity at the same time be cheerful and pleasant in our deportment. Cheerfulness without levity is one of the Christian graces. We're not jokesters, but we're happy. And, you know, we're, we have a smile on our face. It's fun. To, it's, it's, it's important and nice to be a Christian. We let people know that. The talent of influence, we talked a little bit about that before. It's so important that we, you know, we, have, we all have two talents. No matter, you know, you may not be a great singer, you can't get up front and sing, you may not be a great orator, you may not be, be a good teacher, but you do have a talent for influence and your time. Those are two things we can share with the world. It is in the power of everyone to practice true Christian courtesy, the kind look, the lowly spirit, the contented disposition, the unaffected sincere interest in the welfare of others. These are things that help in the Christian life. And these are the things that, these are wonderful talents. When people see that in us, that we really care about them and we're not, and we're humble and we're not braggadocious and, and we're not argumentative and we listen we carefully listen to somebody else speaking and not so quick to jump in as soon as they stop with our own views. People will see that as something nice and decent and admirable. And they'd want to be, they want to know how we got that. It is wise to seek humility and meekness and carefulness to avoid raising a combative spirit which will close hearts and ears to the truth. Hold your mouth as with a bridle when the wicked are before you. When tempted to say sarcastic things, refrain. Censure no one, condemn no one. Let the life argue for Jesus. And that's so important too. A lot of people will try to be combative with you and try to put you down for your beliefs. Don't get upset, don't get excited. You know, you have the truth, you wanna help them. And they'll see the difference in you. The world is watching, as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier about Catalina, that the, the world was watching her when she was speaking. The eyes of the world are upon us, and we are observed by many of whom we have no knowledge. There are those who know something of the doctrines we claim to believe, and they are noting the effect of our faith on our own characters. So if our characters are faulty, we can't represent the Lord. Refrain, uh, retain the peculiar features of our faith. And yeah, what this is saying is don't be afraid of the commandments of God. Don't mention them. You can. You know, when I, when I first became an Adventist, I was afraid to answer the phone on Sabbath because I didn't have to tell somebody, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I have to keep the Sabbath so I can't talk business today. Call me back on Monday. And then I thought about that and I said, no. Uh, why should I be ashamed? This is, this is, I'm keeping the sound, I'm keeping the fourth commandment. And maybe I could be an influence to someone. So now when somebody calls me, I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I, I keep the Sabbath holy, so call me back on Monday. And, uh, and I remember just this week, uh, I was gonna have some new flooring put in, uh, in in a few of the rooms in my house, and the man called me back and said, well, it's a big job, we're gonna come back on Thursday and Friday and do it. And I said, okay, okay, so I hung up. And then I thought, uh-oh, you know, a lot of times it's gonna take longer than Thursday and Friday, and they're probably gonna to wanna to work on Saturday to finish, and I better tell them, you know. So I called him back, and I said, you know, uh, his name was Corey. I said, you know, Corey, um, this, sometimes a job takes longer than two days, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I don't, I don't wanna have any work done in my, hop, in my house on the Sabbath. And he said, oh, okay. He said, that's fine. He says, uh, we don't normally work on Saturday anyway. He said, if we have more, t and if it takes longer, we'll come back on Monday. And he hung up. But there was an opportunity. I could mention who I was and why I was feeling the way I was. And I also emphasized the fourth commandment. And that was really easy to do. And that's a good influence, right? So we could do that all the time and not, and not be ashamed or afraid to do that. Amen. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. This is Peter and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. 
So uh, as, as I conclude this, I, I'm just saying we're peculiar people and we should be not proud of that, but not afraid to let that be seen because our peculiarity is what will bring people to question themselves. And they'll start to see something in else that they don't have and they'd like to have it. If we're kind, we're generous, we're not combative, we're good listeners, all these things. People, what, you know, because in this world today, as you can see what's going on, there are a few people like that. Everybody is arguing for this and arguing for that. And they can't wait for you to stop so they can start talking. The good listeners, humble people, putting others ahead of yourselves, those are the things that we have to do. We're peculiar. And, we're gonna st and we should be happy that we're peculiar because we can influence others in that as well. So thank you. And, um, oh, I have one more. In this world, we are to be represented of Christ. He has called us to glory and virtue. As he has represented the Father, so are we to represent him in this world. For in representing him, we are representing the Father. And we want to do that. We do want to represent the Father. So Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come this morning to worship you. We ask that your Holy Spirit warm our hearts now as we go throughout the rest of this Sabbath day. May we keep it holy and may we truly be a light to others in this community and in the world. We want to represent you fully, Lord, in all that we say and all that we do. So bless us, please. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.